Firebyte. This time we're going to be covering a Dimension 102, doing a little play on the, the D words, deciphering data within Dimension. And throughout the week I get a number of uh, emails, I see a number of you at trade shows. You always ask me, you know, is there a way that I can catch up, uh, I maybe miss a certain episode or two? Absolutely. You have the YouTube channel right there, youtube.com forward slash watchguard NW, uh, also for the Southwest as well. Um, so those videos are posted there. Also a um, great repository of other wealth of information, multi-WAN, branch office VPN, you name it, everything um, is getting posted there. As well as uh, if you have any future topic ideas, you say, you know, gosh, Johan, it would really be great to see X, Y, and Z or to look at how to set up branch office VPNs or how I can use my iPad for my uh, mobile VPN. Absolutely, send those ideas over to me. Most of you have my email address. Uh, you can certainly uh, throw it up at the end as well. So to kick things off today, again, with Dimension 102, deciphering data, as we talk about in Dimension 101, just to recap that, uh, you can download Dimension absolutely free uh, from software.watchguard.com. Read the release notes for Dimension 1.3 update uh, for installation or, or upgrade information. Just make sure if you have an existing Dimension database and you go to upgrade it, just make sure you follow those upgrade steps so that you don't uh, wipe out your entire um, data. That wouldn't be good. Also, know that, um, you know, as a side note, 11.95 just posted, um, so exciting news on the XTM side, and I actually just got my hands on the new beta, um, which includes FQDN, which I'm ex extremely excited about when we start talking about policies. I know a lot of you have Office 365, and to be able to address those policies based on domain or fully qualified domain names rather than just IP addresses. So. Hang on to your seats uh, while we get that going for you guys. If you are interested in the beta program, let me know and I can get you signed up as well. So Dimension, just to recap again, it can be deployed as either a Hyper-V or VMware. Now I have a number of uh, questions from people that say, hey, can I run it in X, Y, and Z build? Can I run it in, um, for instance, uh, Amazon Web Services? And yes, there have been some uh, reportings of people that have been able to successfully port those over. However, from a support side, you can imagine that um, we need to basically just limit uh, the number of platforms that we're going to support. So today it's Hyper-V and VMware. And they can be deployed as an appliance. Uh, now with it, within that uh, VMware component, there are a number of free tools available. I know you can get ESX uh, free, you can get uh, VMware Workstation. And a lot of people are interested in actually how I set up my demos or um, maybe I'm traveling on the road. How do I get all of these systems to work uh, one, with one another? So as you can see here, this is my actual installation. I've got um, a Dimension 1.3 sitting in a VMware workstation. Um, I also have a Windows 8 uh, that's behind the XDMV. It's a small uh, virtual edition of the firewall. And then I have a Windows XP uh, computer that's easy to be able to manipulate and um, throw, for instance, CryptoLocker against it and be able to uh, analyze those changes. And then as well as a Windows 8 uh, machine. The, these are the Windows 8 and XP are behind the XTMB, as well as Dimension, and that's how it's reporting. So just a heads up how that's uh, my environment set up. So as we look at today in the agenda specifically for today, uh, we had wanted to go over a number of things with you. So Dimension 102, um, you know, we've kind of been over some of these elements before, but uh, I just want to go over them again and make sure everyone understands there have been a number of changes specifically with user reporting. So rather than more of a summary report, we have the ability now to dive in and find out what exactly, for instance, this uh, example user, Morris Shaw, is searching for something on um, Craigslist. What is he looking for? I had that request quite a bit as a uh, network administrator and a director at a school district where the special ed director would come up and say, you know what, um, we have Johnny under some sort of monitoring plan. We want to find out what he's looking for. And certainly we can give those uh, details to you as well. You know, the typical um, question, 
why could my boss not get to a go-to meeting last night? Now, if it were anyone else, we might not care so much. However, if it's your boss, obviously you're going to want to get that, um, get to the bottom of that and get it resolved. Why can't Morris uh, download EXE files? Now, a number of you already are thinking ahead, thinking about those proxy and um, how the body content types are probably blocking those EXEs. But we're going to show you how to look at those in the log files. And then the, um, also important uh, element, we're going to investigate data loss prevention. Um, we see a number of people actually now, for instance, getting on APT blocker. And unfortunately, I just uh, had a call with a customer of ours. Um, they just bought WatchGuard APT blocker, put it in. It turns out that they um, unfortunately had a data breach. Now, had they had the um, component of data loss prevention, had those signatures running, they would have been able to um, at least curtail that uh, leakage event before it was happening or um, before they found out from another source. So they would be able to see those patterns as it uh, went through. So, and then um, lastly, we're going to look at point of sale traffic. You know, again, so critical in this uh, day and age where we see uh, retail breaches left and right. And it's really about that network uh, segmentation, making sure that your point of sale systems aren't able to overlap into, um, well, for lack of a better example, into the HVAC, uh, like with the target, where a partner entered the HVAC uh, partner portal and they had access into um, the cross contaminated that uh, traffic. So again, as um, just in true form, we're going to look at uh, more of a hands-on depth. I did want to bring this up, as I kind of alluded to um, previously, as we look at these data breaches, for instance, um, you know, maybe today you get APT blocker, you get it installed. However, maybe you already have an ongoing event in your organization or some sort of infected malware that this data is being leaked out. So how can you get that? So, you know, just from the slides there, APT blocker is great, but what if you install it after a computer is infected? Can we use data loss prevention to monitor for data going across the network? Absolutely. And then the other important element that I want to just uh, reiterate time and time again with all of you, um, and certainly if you have more security tips as well, feel free to share them with us. We're just a community of network administrators trying to protect our networks and um, have best practices. So uh, what I wanted to also look at is let's invest, investigate three common protocols that people have typically allow through. Now, when we talk about people converting over from an ASA to a watch card, um, you know, it's a very, it's an open, more, most times it's a very open system coming from an ASA. You're looking at um, maybe a, uh, a whitelist. Now we're going to be looking at um, essentially restricting everything and allowing only a few policies to get through. Because as we look at that, for instance, DNS lookups, NTP lookups, um, there's also FTP, not that common, but we're seeing more and more um, malware or command and control traffic or those data loss um, e events going across these typical ports um, such as you know 53 for DNS lookup. Because Generally, network administrators have just let those policies um, open on their firewall. So rather than just letting, a, for instance, allow internal to any external for DNS, let's go ahead and look at locking those down. Maybe we have a DNS server on site, or maybe we want to just restrict access to, for instance, Google's, I think it's the most well-known IP address uh, for a DNS server, 8888, or also 8844. So really, let's look at locking that down. Same thing with NTP. Um, you know, a number of uh, malware are using those channels, NTP. We're going to look at that, um, how we can use dimensions to be able to investigate those um, uh, traffic patterns. So as I switch over into my dimension environment, um, you know, the, the first thing that we wanted to look at is really um, investigating that uh, a user, uh, what they're doing on dimension. So looking at this, we, um, I simply point to, I have a dimension already installed. My firewall is pointing over to dimension. Now, a number of times I hear from people, my dimension reports look nothing like uh, what you have here. And just to recap, as we look through these dashboards, 
you know, top clients, that's pretty simplistic. Um, we understand what that means, top domains. Now, as we look at, for instance, URL categories and uh, top domains, these two tie directly into WebLocker. So if you don't have a WebLocker subscription, you're not going to be able to see those components on there. And again, WebLocker, not just important for uh, blocking adult materials, but also for that command and control. A number of you have heard me say, you know, it stops CryptoLocker because it can't get those encryption keys. Application is through app control. So again, as we look at our network, we have the ability to find out exactly what's going on, um, as well as top protocols as well down here. So if we were to, for instance, look at um, yesterday's traffic, oh, and by the way, no surprise here to a number of you, I'm sure you are seeing the same uh, results on your networks. We see top talker, NCA, um, NCAA.com. For most of you, you're well aware that we're in the midst of March Madness. What can WatchGuard do to block that? Um, check out App Control. I just did a traffic management series on being able to control that streaming media so that they don't monopolize your network. So just be aware that uh, we have that functionality for you with 11.94 um, so that you know you could still have people happily watching their brackets crumble. Um, sorry for those of you as the, whose brackets are crumbling, but you can watch those games and still have that uh, mission critical if that's the decision you want to make in your organization. So as we look at, for instance, yesterday's traffic, and just as a heads up, you know, a lot of times people don't realize that we can go back in time, but we can also look at, for instance, windows of time. So if I wanted to look at, um, you know, what happened, um, for instance, my boss tried to get on uh, last night. We can look at, for instance, a specific time window and see, uh, for instance, different patterns. We can also go into, in this particular case, my boss had called me and said, you know what, last night I um, was trying to get to uh, go to meeting or whatnot. So we can investigate what those um, cases are. So if we go in and actually uh, look at Log Manager, we have a number of different ways that we can get to your full um, user uh, detail report. And a number of people don't realize that um, a dimension is only storing, for instance, a very small packet header information. It's not storing that whole packet. So. Um, as you're talking about logging over, maybe it's the internet, and we're encrypting that so that no one can read that, don't worry, it's not 100% per 100% packet size on there. It's only a header um, as well as a different size. So when we look at that, we can see the deny, we see the ports, we see that um, this one was denied from an IP spoofing aspect. But if we wanted to, for instance, we could look at a summary. So again, I'm curious about more Shaw. I'm just going to run a report on Morris Shaw. We're going to see those um, very high level. Uh, let's see here. Very high level um, perspective of what they're doing. Uh, we see some Dropbox traffic, NCAA, uh, no surprise there. But we can actually go into a full detail report from here. So as we look at um, you know, the full URL audit details, we can see exactly what um, has been going on with this user. We see safe browsing. Uh, so we, right here we have the full URI um, information, um, which would give you the idea of uh, what they're surfing for, for instance, on, um, let's look at uh, Seattle Craigslist, for instance. So if I wanted to, I could type in a Seattle Craigslist find search and I believe I might have had the wrong date on that let's just go ahead and look so if I wanted to I could also take it from this view log manager I could say um, let's look at for instance this view here be able to investigate what that tra um, traffic patterns was uh, giving at that point we can also change it over to 500 records per page. Now, the easiest might be if you actually look at how to uh, slice and dice this information, I love to be able to just bring it in Excel and do my uh, custom searches from that way. So if I wanted to do it, um, for instance, a detailed report, we look at, um, again, Morris Shaw, be able to export that out 
um, into Excel and be able to find that query. And it generally, it would look like um, Seattle. Obviously, I don't have uh, Excel on here. But if I wanted to, I could look at uh, seattlecraigslist.org, find in um, that information, what he was searching, um, and go from there. So in this particular case, let's look at a date range here. Because I want to find out what Morris Shaw has been doing over a specific date range. And I can easily do that uh, by choosing um, a date range under here. And then we can also export this out, um, as I mentioned. So if we look, going back, looking at that security dashboard, I did want to show um, you another thing right here. So APT blocker, as we look at this, we can see, for instance, we want that visibility right up front on a zero-day malware. So I can see um, three particular uh, cases came through. And I can simply click on them at this point, change the um, cookie crumbs, look at what Caitlin has um, been doing, and then I can go into full detail reports from here. So as we look at, um, for instance, advanced malware, I'm going to look at, for instance, here, this is a perfect season for this, and I'm sure that we're going to see it more often, a tax refund document. So I'm sure that um, any number of you would uh, know someone that would click on a document at this point that says tax refund or enter in your social security number to find out how much. And again, it's that security in depth presentation um, from WatchGuard, being able to look at web blocker, DLP. And now as we look at that um, individual threat level, we see here, for instance, I've tried to modify ActiveX control restrictions. If there was a some sort of macro in that Excel document, we would be able to see that uh, here as well. So as we look at registering a new browser helper, and you know, I was just thinking about that the other day. I remember the days where, as a, a tech department, we used to be able to clean machines 100% from viruses. Now we're seeing that, you know, for instance, even Explorer.exe is being um, hijacked, and now inserts um, some sort of malware at the base level so that really there's no way to uh, clean the computer without um, reformatting it and there's even uh, some malware that um, lays within there as well. So the next thing I want to show you is when we talk about, um, for instance, uh, investigating data loss prevention. So looking at um, those reports of data loss prevention, I mentioned that maybe you get a VT blocker or maybe you want to just run a trial a uh, 30-day trial of APT blocker, DLP, make sure that nothing's going on. So, for instance, under this data loss prevention, I see two rules here. Now, obviously, that's um, quite concerning for me. It should be for every organization. We can actually go in and um, see more details on that activity. Now, one of the, well, both of them were actually mine. I just wanted to point out what, how that was actually picked up. And, don't worry about this. Um, we have customer records extract. It's just a fictitious data that I have uh, created. So as we look at this um, a fictitious data, and we see time and time again where maybe there are social security numbers that were leaked or credit cards. But there's actually none of uh, the co credit cards within here. There's only date of birth, um, customer ID, state, address. And yet we're able to build or uh, select signatures through WatchCard's DLP, be able to detect that. So that ultimately, even if it's um, this that looks as uh, innocent as this information, we're going to go ahead and be able to block that. And um, even within zips, we can do that as well. So looking back at this, um, let's go back to my Windows 8 environment. Now, another easier way to be able to uh, look at this traffic is through policy match, or map, I'm sorry. So as I look at this, um, traffic. I see a number of, uh, you know, truthfully it does look overwhelming at first, but I can simply break it down by choosing um, individual areas where I want to look at. So for instance, if I want to look at APT, I can simply click on APT and find out um, what's going on in my network. Now in this particular case, what I wanted to look at is data loss violation. So again, how that uh, data is uh, leaking or ultimately I was able to block it, but how that's trying to traverse my network. Now keep in mind that you know this, your watch card's not going to be able to um, 
stop someone from putting on a jump drive and walking out the front door. But as long as it goes across the firewall, we're going to be able to see that and um, stop it and alert the people that we uh, need to alert on that. So for instance, we see here postal addresses. We had two infractions. We see credit card signature, um, and then we also have postal addresses. Now in this particular case, um, you might be thinking, well, why was one credit card allowed through? And I was actually just playing with the, the um, security policies at that point, and I had allowed it to go through, and then I had stopped it. So we can easily say, well, let's view those connections, find out exactly what happened. And in this particular case, it was Morris Shaw. Um, the, we see the first allow attempt. I changed it around uh, 738, and then um, went ahead and blocked it. So the other thing on here that I wanted to show is as we look at policy audits, um, and let's look at, uh, for instance, today's perspective. Now, one of the things I wanted to mention is when you build, um, for instance, your policies under there, you have your uh, trusted external, you have your custom. So maybe one of your custom ones is point of sale system, which is what's going on here. Now, as I look at that, I can follow my point of sale traffic as it goes through my network. Now, in this particular case, we, we see here that it was actually, um, we had two strands come off and denied. We also had some traffic that was allowed out through. If I wanted to, I could easily click on um, this traffic view connections and find out why that was um, allowed to, through. And um, obviously very concerning, we have a, a source of infected computer, and then we can um, be able to investigate a little further on that for that point of sale system. So again, a great way to look at the traffic as it's coming across that interface, and you want to make sure that that tra traffic is completely segmented out. Now the other important thing, I, and I, we have covered how to do more of those user investigations, so I wanted to, um, before our time runs out, look at how we can use the tools that we have, um, for instance, with top protocol, and start to analyze, make sure that we don't have any traffic going through those that we shouldn't have. So um, as we look at, for instance, yesterday's traffic, let's just go ahead and uh, choose yesterday. Now, very concerning as well as, um, you know, maybe your policies aren't up to date uh, today. But as we look at, um, uh, let's choose, I have that time slot set. There we go. So in this particular case, we see top protocols. You might actually have to click on um, the top protocols to be able to see. But what I wanted to focus on is SMTP and NTP. As I, um, as you might have recalled, you know, we had talked in the beginning about making sure that you know what's going across your NTP traffic, your DNS, and your SMTP. Now, in this particular case, I actually had a network administrator contact me one day and say, gosh, um, someone plugged in a jump drive and infected the computer, and now it's sending all this spam out from this computer, and it's lowering our reputation of the IP address. So I said, well, come in here, click on SMTP. Now, in my particular case, I just have my a Windows server, which is also Exchange, labeled as WDS server, sending out, and we see top destination. So not that um, alarming. However, if you take that same scenario and you look at, for instance, um, or you would see in your environment where you haven't locked down the SMTP policies to only allow your email server to be able to um, email out, let's take a look at, for instance, NTP. And I'm actually quite alarmed on this. I'm going to um, dig into this deeper. But um, for instance, I have this infected computer, this Windows XP that's on my network. And it's quite alarming because as we look at NTP or um, for my time protocol, traditionally in a, a corporate environment, we might have uh, one NTP server um, or a redundant one in-house. And that's essentially what controls all of the, um, maybe it's Active Directory, synchronization because everything's based on time with encryption. Um, so as we look at uh, NTP, for instance, the WDS server, it's not that concerning to see that. That's reaching out probably to Microsoft or to NTP pool. But what is alarming on this is my top, um, my infected computers. So again, this is allowed traffic out. And as we look at those policies, 
and this is what I've seen a lot, not that I recommend it at all, but you know, as people try to go and um, uh, secure their firewalls, for instance, maybe they start to build policies up here to address different users, but then they forget about this blanket policy at the bottom that's simply covering everything else. So anything else that wants to go out is going out this policy. So make sure you deal with that. As we look at, for instance, DNS, it's very typical that we would maybe see DNS, any trusted to any external, and maybe the same thing for NTP. So again, make sure, I can't um, stress it enough, make sure that you are building policies so that only one device in your network can get out to only one device externally. Because as we look at this, um, for instance, NTP, we see that this infected computer is trying to talk back over the NTP channel um, to all these random IP addresses. Um, you know, of course, we could do a, um, a look up where those IP addresses are, what networks they are, but um, and just be aware. The other thing that I would, so now let's say we build policy to limit those traffic. We want to find out, well, um, we're not seeing them under allowed, but are we still seeing them under uh, the, for instance, deny traffic? And absolutely, as we look at top block protocols, and again, maybe you need to right click or um, click on this to get in. We see NTP, so again, maybe on your network, um, you do have the right policies in place that you're blocking that. However, it still would behoove you to uh, look at NTP, find out what computers are trying to phone home, and then maybe run a scan on those computers and find out what exactly they're doing. Again, as we look at this, um, looking at uh, SMTP policy, again, we might have to click on this, SMTP. Now we're seeing, for instance, my guest Wi-Fi user. That's funny. Why is my guest Wi-Fi user trying to send emails across my network? Most of the time now it's either through G Gmail or um, Outlook web access through um, Office 365, and that's all over 443 traffic. So just make sure, again, that you have that visibility into your network. You're monitoring that. Um, and again, APT blocker, absolutely phenomenal tool. However, if you, you could possibly already have an infected computer, then maybe DLP is going to be able to give you more insight into that as well. And again, at WatchGuard, we're extremely focused on security, being able to give you a deep packet inspection out of the box so that you know if someone's trying to email out um, postal addresses or trying to upload them to Dropbox, FTP, or if it's an infected computer and you're blocking them through web blocker. So again, phenomenal tools. Um, we have reached at uh, 1031, so I want to be cognizant of your time. I apologize that we didn't get through every single element of that, but I know that we've covered user investigations. I wanted to bring a different um, aspect to Dimension to be able to investigate whether or not you have some malicious activity happening on your network. And then obviously the other component is under security dashboard. When you have that web blocker and that security um, through there, for instance, newly registered websites, that's a lot of times where these APTs are coming from. So just make sure that you use these tools. They're free. You have no reason not to use them. Um, you can actually install them on a laptop, uh, dimension on a laptop, just like I've done. Uh, so again, within a five-minute install, you have full visibility into what's going on in your network. Um, so with that, I wanted to thank you for your time. I will throw up my uh, final slide. The next Firebytes is actually going to be on April 17th, um, and then we also have the YouTube channel there, and again, my personal email address if you want to be able to um, send out future topics or recommendations or any general tips or tricks. I'd love to hear from you guys, and we'll include that in uh, the next Firebytes.